All right, hello, hello. Welcome, one and all. Thank you for coming to the latest meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. I'm Kevin Kosar of R Street, and my co director of the group is Lee Gutman here of New America. Just a few quick items before uh, we turn it over to the experts in foreign policy, which Lee and I are not. Um, first, as you probably saw when you came in, we have hats. The iconic Make Congress Great Again hats, which are popping up all over the internet in America. <laughs> They're free. Take as many as you like. Wear them loud, wear them proud, share them. Uh, next, I also put on in front of you a copy of a recent issue of CQ magazine. And Stapled my card to a page. Um, I feel like Trump was an executive order doing this, but I'll big past that. Um, it's real. CQ did a very nice piece on the legislative branch capacity working group, which kind of talks about the genesis of the group and what the point of the group is, um, which is to encourage thinking about con Congress as an institution and to encourage. Uh, congressional staff to come up with ideas about how to upgrade Congress's capacity to operate in the 21st century, but I'll say no more on that. Um, I think you'll find it a fun read if you haven't seen it already. So the topic of the day is congressional capacity and foreign affairs. One of the pieces of paper in front of you is an article I, I wrote a couple years ago. Again, I'm not an expert on foreign policy, but I felt like I had to speak up. Uh, this was surrounding the Senate and the handling of the, uh, I guess it's called the Iran deal. I was really kind of surprised at how many voices in Congress were saying, hey, this is a foreign policy thing. This is not really our business. The president's our commander in chief. He should be handling this. Um, and my little column here, uh, yes, Congress has a role in foreign affairs, was a, a response to that. Because anyone who picks up the Constitution knows that Congress has a role. It's right there. Whether it's appointing the people who run foreign affairs, whether it's the funding of foreign affairs, whether it's the scope of the responsibilities of the agencies involved in foreign affairs, uh, to say nothing of the oversight committees. So that's that. So now let me turn it over to our two guest speakers who have real experience, who work on foreign affairs, and they're each going to take uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes to have their say, and then we're going to open up the floor uh, for questions and for folks to share their own thoughts. And you'll see the camera in front of us. Uh, no, we're not live streaming. And when we do post this on YouTube, we're going to end it before your questions start. So your anonymity is maintained. And certainly, the camera's only pointing at us, not at any of you. So with that, let me turn it over first to Kate Kidder. Or do you want to have Kirk go first? All right, Kirk, we'll see you. Thank you. Sure. So I'm Kirk Couchman. I'm currently serving as uh, Vice President of Public Policy at the Defense Priorities Foundation. As a new think tank working in defense and foreign policy. Um, before this, I spent six years on Capitol Hill. Uh, most recently, I was legislative director for Congressman Dave Bratt in Virginia. And before that, uh, four years as a policy staffer for Congressman Justin Amash from Michigan. Um, in my remarks, I'm really just going to be skimming the surface. You can go a lot deeper into everything that I'll be talking about. And if you want to go there during QA, I'm certainly happy to. Um, to answer the question posed by the title of today's event, does Congress have the capacity it needs in foreign affairs? No. And by that, I'm defining capacity as the incentive for members to be active players in foreign affairs. Uh, the invite itself mentions a number of problems. Uh, you know, Congress has a power to declare war. Does it use it? What is war in the modern context? Of cyber and um, you know, drones and all that sort of thing. Uh, when is an AUMF needed? Uh, we would argue that 
uh, when you send kinetic devices into another country's territory, that constitutes an act of war and it's appropriate for Congress to provide an AUMF if Congress thinks that that's the right thing to do. Uh, funding the military, I mean, that's one thing that Congress uh, does a very good job of every year. Uh, there's a National Defense Authorization Act, has been for 50 some years, and every year the Department of Defense gets funded with one recent exception with the shutdown. Um, but eventually that was all funded. Um, and that's continuing to be a big topic of debate. The treaty issue, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran uh, under President Obama, and also some of the climate uh, executive agreements, which properly understood should be treaties that come before the Senate. Um, on commerce, there are a number of statutes that deal with our international commerce. Um, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 gives Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce, but there's so much executive discretion in there that Senator Mike Lee has seen fit to introduce legislation pulling some of that back. Uh, another more fundamental issue uh, that maybe is more indicative is that a number of the foreign affairs related titles of law aren't even codified as positive law. Um, those specifically, you know, foreign relations and intercourse, it's Title 22, and war and national defense, Title 50, those are just sort of bundles of organic laws that uh, have been put together by the Office of the Law Review Council. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have Title 10, 14, 32, and 38, which are Armed Forces, Coast Guard, National Guard, and Veterans Benefits that are codified as titles. There's some complicated reasons why that matters. Um, with respect to what's happening in the Department of Defense, um, Congress is very involved. Uh, in fact, there's both uh, ex excessive delegation as well as micromanagement there. Um, but the fundamental problem in foreign affairs is, is that there isn't uh, necessarily a well-defined, coherent, articulated, publicly debated grand strategy that both the executive branch and Congress have agreed on. So I want to diagnose some of the root causes of the dysfunction and then have some prescriptions for how to make things work better. Uh, first, you have distractions. Um, the Constitution was established to provide limited enumerated powers to Congress. It's doing a lot of things beyond that. It makes it hard to focus on the things that can only be done at the federal level. With respect to personnel, it's a common theme with this group. Uh, the ability to attract and retain uh, well-qualified people to advise members of Congress uh, could be better. You can make a, a career pretty well at the State Department or as a Foreign Service Officer. Uh, on Congress, given two terms, six terms, um, and all of the other things going on, it's harder to make a career out of it. The organizational structure of Congress can be a problem. Uh, armed services, their job is to make sure that the military can fight and win um, and be prepared to do so. Uh, foreign affairs and foreign relations uh, get into the more soft power pieces, but also grand strategy, when to actually enter into conflicts. But at least over the last couple of years, maybe decades, there hasn't been the same level of commitment to making sure that those authorities are updated in the way that the armed services authorities are. The process uh, also has some problems with respect to appropriations. Almost all of defense and foreign affairs spending is discretionary spending. It's not on autopilot the way that mandatory spending is. Uh, a few exceptions. But appropriations has become basically on autopilot. Uh, when we get to the end of a fiscal year, most of the time we haven't actually passed appropriations acts. And so we do a CR or an omnibus, which means that programs aren't being considered on their own individual merits they're being bundled all together with everything else. The Senate filibuster, obviously in the news recently for uh, the Supreme Court, um, it may be creating a vacuum that makes Congress, through the Senate, um, somewhat unable to act even when things need to be done, and into that void steps the executive branch. Um, there are constituency issues, um, you'll win political office by getting votes. There's not that many voters that vote on the basis of foreign affairs issues. Defense more so, but certainly not the other aspects of uh, foreign relations. Campaign money, there is some uh, level of contributions tied to foreign affairs. Not so much compared to the domestic. It's a relatively small issue. Um, when it comes to members, there are not that many with the foreign affairs background. I think we have two ambassadors, or former ambassadors, currently serving in Congress. 
we have a lot more former military personnel, some current military personnel. Um, so that seems to be understood a lot more. And then once members are here, they're so busy with everything that there isn't really that much time to learn the ropes and to take a deep dive into international relations and understanding the conflict zones. Now, how to address this? Um, there are existing tools that members could use if they chose to. First is the War Powers Resolution. There's a privilege resolution that can be used uh, if the President uh, has entered forces into conflict for 60 days. There's other restrictions on it. Uh, it hasn't really been that effective at either stimulating a debate or changing policy, however. Another option that I'm not aware of it ever being used is that a majority of committee members in both the House and the Senate can actually force a committee to have hearings or markups on whatever question that majority uh, wants to do. And that is in House Rule 11C and Senate Rule 26.3. Each of the committees <coughs> have that incorporated into their own rules. Uh, another interesting one that I haven't seen used yet um, for this purpose is House Rule 9, uh, which provides privileged status to questions uh, that are affecting the rights, uh, the rights of the House collectively, its safety, dignity, and the integrity of its proceedings if there is an instance where uh, the president is acting um, and encroaching upon Congress's powers, arguably you can make a case for some action under Rule 9 there. And there are various set of points of order that I don't pretend to understand because I'm a house guy. I think there's also great potential for institutional changes. You may all re uh, recall the, the, the phrase, hate the game, don't hate the player. It's the same thing with Congress. I mean, people bust on members of Congress all the time for the incentives that they face. If you want to change the way that they act, you have to change the incentives. Um, I've been involved with rules change and process items a lot over the last couple of years. Um, but let's reason by analogy. So imagine basketball, right? Best game out there, best sport. Um, imagine it without the three second rule. So, you know, you're a big defender, or a big um, offensive person, you just hang out in the basket, you just lob it up there. And it would totally change the game. Um, or if, um, you know, you, uh, I saw this recently, one of my daughters is um, doing like beginning basketball. They don't enforce the double dribble or the traveling rule so much, so it, it's just hilarious to watch. But it's a different game. You change the rules, the game changes, the way it's played changes. And one important piece of this has to be restoring the power of the purse. Everybody talks about Congress has the power of the purse, but because everything is on, on autopilot, either as mandatory spending or through the broken discretionary process, um, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, and so one way to approach this is uh, to change the defaults. Right now, to change anything from the status quo, you have to forge a consensus. Um, another approach could be to unbundle everything and require consensus to keep programs alive. So this would be fairly disruptive um, to have to go through all the programs, but it would probably lead to a winnowing, where the ones that don't really make sense on their own, that have been kept alive through log rolling, it would start to fall off, and there would be more opportunity for members <coughs> and staff to focus on the things that Congress really needs to be engaged in. Um, there are some movements in this direction. Uh, Chairman, former Chairman Nunes of the Intelligence Committee uh, offered a, an amendment, I think it was withdrawn, that would have um, re redesigned the committees, the entire committee structure of the House, or would have required rules to report a proposal to redesign the committees, to get rid of the Appropriations Committee, to give the Appropriations power to uh, a whole redesigned set of authorizing committees. Uh, Congressman Tom McClintock and Congresswoman Kathy Morris Rogers uh, have their own individual proposals for addressing this issue of unauthorized programs. Um, another thing that might help with the winnowing is some sort of binding budget constraints. Um, there's been a lot of talk about balanced budget amendments. That's a high hurdle. There are things you could do through statute to require um, a path towards a balanced budget or something like that. And you could have a series of political and automatic enforcement tools, hopefully something a little more thoughtful than sequestration of the Budget Control Act. Um, you could make budgets matter. At the state level, when they strike a budget deal between the governor, the House, and the Senate, um, that, that actually matters. The policies generally get carried out. Here in Congress, the congressional budget, well, it's not agreed to with the president, and it's filled with a series of assumptions, which in the last couple of years would have put us on a path to a balanced budget, but they're just assumptions. There's no uh, requirement that the committees of jurisdiction actually do anything to carry that out. 
one way of making that enforceable is for the steering committees to partially make committee membership uh, contingent on um, members' willingness to advance budget priorities. Another approach would be to have the committee simply represent uh, the conferences. Um, if you look at certain committees, say the Oversight and Government Reform Committee or uh, the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the House, those tend to skew more conservative. The median member of those committees is more conservative than the average House Republican, for example. If you look at Ways and Means, Appropriations, Energy and Commerce, it's the other direction. Less conservative median and less conservative chairs than the conference as a whole. Uh, I'm not calling for perfect distribution, I'm just suggesting that it might go a long way towards um, members figuring out where the problems might be before they run into them as they're trying to bring something to the floor. We also have to think about reversing over-delegation, or to put it in a different way, stop congressional abdication and executive branch usurpation, and also discipline the administrative state. With all the programs we have, we can't get rid of the administrative state, but we could certainly discipline it more than we have been. Uh, and I'll get back to the, the, the filibuster. The, um, it might be worth considering ending the legislative filibuster in the way that the nominations filibuster has basically been ended, uh, and otherwise reforming the Senate rules. The filibuster, as I think all of you know, has been a barrier to what probably each of us would agree in different ways has been bad policy, um, but it has also become a barrier to reform. That's not my main point, though. Um, what I referenced before is that you know, having to get to 60 votes in the Senate for everything means that the Senate can't act, and by extension the Congress can't act, um, unless there's a pretty high degree of consensus beyond what's already uh, inherent in having a, a Senate that's composed of two senators per state and a Congress that represents the population uh, more so. Um, and this stasis and inaction on the part of Congress tends to breed a certain amount of complacency and inaction on the part of Congress and into that vacuum, the president must step sometimes or chooses to step in other cases. It might be worth looking at uh, changing the process to give standing to a certain number of members to litigate on constitutional questions before the Supreme Court. Now, Congress doesn't have an army, um, the Supreme Court doesn't have an army, but if uh, a certain number of members and the Supreme Court agree that the president has overstepped his proper bounds, then that helps uh, with the public conversation and, and disciplining um, those sorts of things and putting power back where it belongs. Uh, another thing that should just be done as a matter of course is to have specific instructions on legislation. Uh, Ken Buck from Colorado got a standing order in the House Republican Conference Rules uh, having to do with Article One powers. And um, if that were actually carried out, there'd be a lot less um, for the executive branch to figure out, a lot less, less discretion, and Congress would have to come up with the specific policy objectives they want to be carried out. Um, there is potential for some sort of a, a Senate point of order to be established along those lines. Um, and then another thing that isn't an institutional reform, but is kind of in that direction, would be some sort of reporting on bills and amendments that violate treaties or other legal commitments that we have. Now, uh, laws passed by Congress, I believe, I'm not a lawyer, are on equal legal standing for domestic purposes with treaties that have been ratified by the Senate. Anyone want to nod or shake their head? No? Okay. Um, so I'm just hanging out there on that one. Um, but uh, we've seen some instances of this in the past, and Buy American has um, upset some of our, uh, our trading partners. Uh, the uh, certificate of origin labeling for certain meat products has actually been reversed by Congress due to litigation on the part of some of our trading partners. Uh, and it would just be helpful for staff to know uh, what's out there. When I was a staffer, I had basically no idea uh, what the specifics of our treaty obligations under um, the World Trade Organization things were, under the Geneva Conventions, under so many other things. And if the Foreign Affairs Committee or GAO or CRS or someone could just let members of Congress and staff know before the fact, after the fact, anything would be helpful uh, when we are potentially running afoul of international obligations and what the consequences might be. That would probably help get Congress back in the game, too. And with that, um, I'm ready to turn it over to Kate. All right, well, I'm glad to be here. My name is Kate Kidder. I'm with the Center for New American Security, where I run our Rebuilding the Bipartisan Defense Consensus program where in addition to uh, supporting staff members on uh, specific 
questions and legislative priorities. We also work uh, closely with members of Congress from both sides of the aisle, from the House and the Senate, um, to bring them together and, and talk through some of the, the more nitty gritty um, details of, of what legislation actually means. So what what is a sanction and how does it function? Or um, you know, what, what goes into the defense budget and, and how exactly uh, does that play out in our ability to perform on the world stage um, in ways that, you know, not necessarily every congressman or senator would want to admit maybe they don't know how those things function. Um, and and the, the real driving motivator behind that is also to bring together members of Congress who would not normally sit down at a table together um, and, and build those relationships so that they're able to see where they overlap on priorities um, and where they can move forward on bipartisan legislation. Um, so, you know, as, as comes up frequently, um, Congress is, it has both the roles and responsibilities outlined in the Constitution in foreign policy, but their role, the, the role of the legislative body uh, in foreign policy predates the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton was writing about this, you know, well before the Constitution and the Federalist Papers about the need for a deliberative process so that foreign policy was not given to the whims of one, one person. Um, and I think, um, you know, as we've seen over and over in history, the, the deliberative process that sometimes can be a hindrance is also something that leads to perhaps better foreign policy or more um, thoughtful engagement and also ties back to the American people and, and their interests. Um, so another role that, that Congress can really play right now uh, at this moment in history is that we have a, a relatively inexperienced administration and what Congress can do is serve as, as a smoothing function in our foreign policy so that there is some consistency um, for international, international posturing. Uh, defense and foreign policy um, and, and national security issues you know, it was long said that politics ends at the water's edge and we had the Cold War consensus, but a lot of times that glossed over the fact that there were nuanced debates um, and that it was never really unanimous. Uh, our, our views on foreign policy within the House and the Senate. Um, but it, it does provide a moment right now where Congress can serve as a true balance on the administration uh, moving forward. So what I, I'll talk through a bit is some of the tools and levers that are available that Kirk touched on, but how they relate to some of the, the breaking international incidents that we have currently. Um, so the, the number one priority I think right now in these, we're still in the first 100 days of the administration, is the Senate's role in the confirmation process. Uh, not only is it a manifestation of the Senate's role in the advice and consent portion of the process, but it also can serve as a um, fact-finding and base-building uh, perspective on what it is the administration sees our, the U.S. foreign policy as. Um, so in order to um, really build the, the competence of, of the Senate, uh, one of the things that we uh, hope that um, around town is happening is that deliberative and thoughtful targeted questions for confirmation hearings are being provided to staffs. Um, there are currently 553 key positions that require Senate confirmation. 478 of them currently have no nominee. Uh, 29 are awaiting confirmation. 24 have been formally nominated and 22 have been confirmed. Within the foreign policy and national security and defense uh, framework, the State Department, uh, we currently have no Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security Affairs, no Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs, serving as a back channel for Congress to the administration. Uh, all of the Assistant Secretary level positions for each of the regions, uh, East Asia, European, Eurasian Affairs, Middle East, are uh, unfilled, which leaves uh, a gaping hole in accountability and oversight. Our only confirmed ambassadors are our ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, and of course Nikki Haley to the UN. Uh, at the Department of Defense, our only confirmed nominee is the Secretary, and the Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson, had her confirmation hearing back on March 31st. Um, some of the key positions to watch are the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Legislative Affairs, and our Assistant Secretary for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities. Um, 
there was a hearing recently on the state of North Korea, um, and one of the biggest critiques that came out of the hearing on North Korea was that there were no diplomatic options brought to the table or brought to the debate, that you know, we, we brought in the defense perspective. Um, but the reality is that we don't have our ambassador to South Korea named, um, and the, the um, South Korea is undergoing a lot of political turmoil currently, and that's our ally in the region. And so it highlights the necessary um, tools and, and personnel placement that are, um, would serve us well to think through a strategy as opposed to thinking through tactical and operational uh, options. On the authorization front, uh, as Kurt touched on, the, the National Defense Authorization Act must be passed annually, and it is the, the only bill kind of, of its type that is passed annually with respect to national security and foreign affairs. Uh, what that means is uh, the temptation is to fit all extraneous talking points on foreign policy or, or issues that are not related to foreign policy whatsoever. So there is you know, a big uh, Twitter following of the sage grouse because there was a, an endangered bird uh, who, you know, a, a senator threw in uh, protections for an endangered bird into the National Defense Authorization Act as a way to move it forward because it's become a bargaining tool uh, because the, the bill has to be passed every year. So how do you fit in your pet projects? There's also some misaligned incentives within the NDAA. So much like the budget and, and the appropriations process being <coughs> autopilot, you see uh, quite a bit of automation so that the NDAA has grown exponentially. It's now in the thousands of pages where uh, originally it was uh, in the two digits of pages because it, we accumulated more and more legislation. And that means that oversight also goes by the wayside because as you're increasing um, the amount of, of the scope of the NDAA, you're, uh, you're minimizing the amount of attention that staff members can, can take to ensure that it's followed. Uh, at the, the regional level, uh, with this, the authorization process uh, looks, looks a bit different. So um, thinking right now through the, the issues with Russia and Russian sanctions in, in particular, uh, there's been a movement afoot. Uh, Representative Leonard Blanche just yesterday put forth the bill um, trying to check the administration's uh, authority or, or power on you know, unilaterally lifting <coughs> sanctions on Russia. So this, this bill um, would put Congress in control of any effort to lift Russian sanctions and would put into statutory law that no action would <coughs> be taken to relieve those sanctions without congressional approval. Of course, they're outside <coughs> of having a bill, uh, whether or not that passes, it does show that there's an appetite within Congress to put a check on these administrative powers. Um, with respect to appropriation, one of the interesting um, scenarios that we're facing right now is uh, ch with China and, and the administration's strategy moving forward. Um, and so there are ways, there are, there are more subtle ways that appropriation can be used as a way to check um, China. So, or, or to check our, our um, Western Pacific strategy, particularly as there were so many resources placed toward that between Congress and the executive during the Obama administration with the rebalance to Asia. Um, and given the administration's uh, appetite essentially uh, to, to focus on um, economic issues within the, the US-China relationship, thinking through what is, what is our defense posture there. So one of the, the major investments that would need to be made is modernizing the U.S. posture towards, uh, towards Asia um, and also thinking through what the strategy is with our security assistance efforts. So in the National Defense Authorization Act of last year, there was actually a, quite an effort to um, smooth over some of the patchwork nature of our foreign assistance um, legislation uh, and, and aligning that with our defense priorities. It's unclear right now, given the priorities that the administration has put forth for um, foreign assistance and for um, our more diplomatic tools, how that will align. But there, Congress has already set the wheels in motion to make that an easier process should the administration choose to implement that. But another way that, that Congress can use appropriations well um, in, um, in defining strategy, particularly in Asia, is by, by putting the money, their money where their mouth is on reporting statutes, um, looking at 
what the um, and what the implications of competition with Asia, whether it's economic or um, coercive, uh, what competition or failure would mean to our allies and partners, particularly Taiwan. On the oversight uh, function, so one of the one of the most useful um, useful tools during this transition period will be to mandate strategic reviews to keep current policy on track or to clearly define what the policy in, in, um, in, in any number of our uh, current engagements is. So thinking through the threat profile that has been laid out or was laid out by the previous uh, Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, looking at our stance towards China, North Korea, Iran, Russia, um, and then of course countering violent extremism. Um, with respect to oversight, too, it's, it's obviously become quite politicized, particularly on the intelligence front, um, and particularly within the Russia context. And so there, there is a way to kind of strip away the political motivations and actually perform uh, oversight. There are a number of elections coming up in Europe that the United States has a vested interest in making sure that they are clear and open and free elections. Um, outside of even any any political motivation for uh, investigating Rus Russian um, uh, incriminations towards the U.S. and our election, there are um, there are real incentives to make sure that that that's not happening in overseas elections. But with respect to Russia, um, there are lessons we learned by previous committees and the resources necessary um, towards. Uh, participating in an investigative committee. So with respect to Russia, looking at some of the lessons from the church committee's investigation into the intel community in the 70s, um, as well as the Iran-Contra Iran affair back in the 80s, uh, the lessons to be taken away from there, and most of those, there were, there were failure points. So there was, at, at times, there were, um, you know, it was for the sake of media attention, it was a partisan. It was seen as a partisan investigation, and uh, what what really needs to drive investigative committees moving forward is um, making sure that they're getting to the root of preserving democracy, whether that's here or abroad. Uh, in order to set up an independent commission to investigate Russia, there um, there are some uh, appropriations issues to think through. So there, uh, an investigative commission. A fairly rare event. There have been six, seven formed between 1989 and last year, uh, and they must be funded. It requires full-time staff to conduct interviews and hearings, and they can run in the order of several thousands of dollars to about $10 million, and that's based on a CRS report that came out in January of this year. Uh, the 9-11 Commission employed 80 individuals and was initially approved for $3 million. Um, but after some pushback between Congress and the Bush administration, uh, there was an additional $9 million allocated to the commission. And because it requires an appropriation, it needs to be signed off by the president. So um, there's a real um, necessity in building bipartisan support and credibility within Congress to um, overcome veto power should, should it come to that. They also must, uh, the Congress must set forth the scope of the commission. So generally you have a 10 member bipartisan panel, um, and, but it's important to, to delineate how far reaching the investigation should go, who should be called to testify, and setting a reasonable timeline for completion, which can actually be a political move in and of itself, uh, making sure that you're allowing enough time, but that you're not allowing so much time that it becomes a non-issue by the time it is um, complete. And thinking through where Congress can invest in staff, um, and this is certainly a focus of, of Lee and Kevin's work, uh, so increasing training for staff, and committee staff, but also for staff directors on the authorities available to you in the oversight process, so whether it's um, su the issuing of subpoenas, um, and then thinking through as well where management training can come in um, through these processes. So, uh, you know, a lot of, and I include myself in this, you know, my experience is much more from a policy or political background and not necessarily from a business or management perspective, but leading some of these initiatives, so uh, a um, bipartisan uh, committee 
looking into an oversight committee um, would require a bit more of the management skill building um, and and making sure that, that staff members are avail are aware of the resources available to them um, and where they do have authority to step in um, and to serve the members that they work with. So with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Kevin. All right, now we'll go to the Q&A, which Lee Drutman will take care of. Okay. All right, now, now we ask some questions. Um, and, and I did want to give the, the first question. We have a special guest from the Open World Program, which is 